right? Show me a sahih hadith that lists the five requirements that make up a had sahih hadith. Is sahih. A hadith is sahih by fulfilling five requirements. A complete chain. Every link in the chain has to be upright. In other words, no accusations against his deen. Uh, and have some people devout for his uprightness. Thirdly, he has to be accurate, meaning that what he transmits and what others transmit from the same source are the same. Fourthly, and fifthly, the absence of contradiction of a higher source or the mistakes of experts. Which is the mistake of such a finite, fine mistake that it's like a mistake of an expert. Okay? It's called the illa. Those five conditions. So he said, if you want to debate with hadith, then show me the hadith that lists these five. So what was his point? His point was, hadith itself, the subject matter of hadith itself, is actually a rational subject. How to, find, to, to determine if a hadith is sound, has, or, or weak, or fabricated, it's a rational subject. Okay? There's only one exception to this subject matter. There's only one part of the subject matter of hadith that is scriptural, purely scriptural. And that is adalatul sahaba That the sahaba are all udul. Udul means that their testimony has to be accepted. That you cannot even investigate them, you cannot go into them, you cannot parse through them and find who is sound and who is unsound. If it's someone has the definition of a Sahabi, okay, then at that point his testimony must be accepted. And the definition of a Sahabi, who here, no, I'm sure you studied this, right, is anyone who was present with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, okay, was present with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a Muslim and died a Muslim. They have it. And you note here that we say that present, why do we say present and not saw the Prophet peace be upon him? Because that would exclude the blind. So there was Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. He never saw the Prophet physically, but he was present with him. Okay. So this is Adalat al Sahaba, is the summarized in this phrase here. Qala ibn Abdul Bar. You all see this? Qala ibn Abdul Bar. الاستيعاب, and I'll put the Arabic here since you're all tulab al ilm, you should be able to, uh, to get the Arabic as well. Okay. Let's get this out of here. Okay. We, are, we have been sufficed from having to investigate them, their stances, and ahwalim, li ijma'i ahl al haqqi min al muslimina. وهم أهل السنة والجماعة على أنهم كلهم عدول فواجب الوقوف على أسمائهم. All right, we've been sufficed from having to investigate their states due to the ijma of the people of truth from the Muslims and their أهل السنة والجماعة that they are all upright. Therefore, it is obligatory to stop upon hearing their names. So, if you go into a chain of hadith and the speaker is a Sahabi, okay, at that and he's part of the chain, you can investigate him and say, well, I don't know who he is. And maybe he's a liar. Maybe he's mistaken. Right? Okay. All right. Now, if he says there's ijma, that means if there's ijma on something, that means there's going to be serious number of ayat and ahadith about the subject. And this is what we're going to cover here. All right. If anyone ever gives you tries to throw any seed of doubt, number one. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا We've made you believers into a just community so that you may bear witness to the truth before others so that the messenger may bear witness before you. The istidlal revolves around the word shuhada, witnesses, which implies their uprightness and integrity as transmitters. You're a witness in court. What, is it, what do they do in court? Let's say you're going to come to show that the criminal, sup supposed criminal, was actually in another location at the night of the murder. 
right? The accused was in a party across town the whole night of the murder. What will the, uh, the lawyer try to do? He's going to try to show before that you're, he's going to show that you're a liar or you're crazy or you're not upright or there's something wrong with you to try to throw your entire testimony out of court. Whoever does this with a Sahabi has done what? Contradicted the Quran. Okay, and this is why Tumatic, anyone who does not accept the Sahaba, all of them as testimony, uh, sound testimony and witnesses to what happened in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu they've contradicted the Book of Allah directly. The second ayah. والسابقون الأولون من المهاجرين والأنصار الذين اتبعوهم بإحسان رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عن وأعد لهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها أبدا ذلك الفوز العظيم. All right, this is a translation of Muhammad ibn Abd uh, Muhammad Abd al-Hanim. God will be pleased with the first emigrants and helpers, those who followed them in good deeds, and they will be pleased with him. Okay. He has prepared gardens of grace, flowing streams there to remain forever. This is the supreme triumph. And those who followed them with ihsan. This can be read as referring to the tabi'een too, which indicates sound understanding and accurate transmission on the part of the sahaba. So if Allah is saying, them and those who followed them, that means those who never saw the Prophet but followed the sahaba, they too are in the pleasure of Allah. Therefore, what the sahaba transmitted was correct. Right? How then could their followers be in paradise? Okay. Now, another point that's very important, because Danny, you had brought up the subject. Well, does that mean, if Allah is pleased with them, does that mean what in the future or just now? It, is all, it also indicates Allah's rida, which is a pre-eternal attribute and therefore includes what they will do in the future. After the passing of the Messenger wasallam, to hold that they intentionally altered the deen afterwards or turned against the Prophet or his family would be a direct contradiction of the Qur'an. Whenever Allah says that he's pleased with someone, he may have announced it at a certain time, but he is pleased with them pre-eternally. And his knowledge of what they will do is pre-eternal. Therefore, when Allah announces the rida upon a person, that includes his future. So when Allah says he's pleased with the companions, it, it's a pre-eternal attribute. That means from when they were, before the creation, he was pleased with them. It includes what they will do in the future as well. Because his attributes are pre-eternal. That doesn't mean he's pleased with them now, then he's going to have a, a mood change and not be pleased with them later. That indicates a change in the attributes of Allah and the attributes of Allah don't change. That means when Umar ibn Khattab was still uh, an idol worshiper, Allah was already pleased with him because Allah knows his end. Okay? So this is the importance that you understand. The attributes of Allah do not change. And his rida is one of his attributes. It cannot change. If he announced his rida upon a sahabi, that is permanent for the rest of the sahabi's life. Next ayah. لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ الَّذِينُ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَأَمْوَالِهِمْ يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانًا وَيَنْصُرُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الصَّادِقُونَ This has a bit of an echo. Can we shut the echo part off? والذين تبوؤوا الدار والإيمان من قبلهم يحبون من هاجر إليهم ولا يجدون في زدون حجز مما أوتوا ويثيرون على أنفسهم ولو كان بهم قصاص ومن يوقش حن نفسه فأولئك هم المفلحون نكس أتبع والذين جاءوا من بعدهم يقولون ربنا اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان تستفعل سدم ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم look how many attributes for the sahaba in this in this uh, there's so many Sadiqun, Muflihun, all right, Sabiqun, Mu'minun. However, what concerns us is only one. Okay, the poor emigrants who were driven from their homes and possessions, who seek God's favor and approval, those who help God and His Messenger, they are the truthful ones, shall have a share. Those who are already firmly established in their homes in Medina, are firmly rooted in faith, show love for those who migrated to them for refuge and harbor no desire in their hearts for what has been given them. They give preference over themselves even if they are too, they too are poor. 
Those who are saved from their own soul's greed and they are truly successful. Those who came after them say, Our Lord, forgive us our sins and the sins of our brothers who believe before us and leave no malice in our hearts towards those who believe. Lord, you are truly compassionate. This verse describes the companions with many praises and commendations. The most important one for our purpose is the description of being truthful. Sadiqun. That Allah describes the Sahaba. And in specific, the Muhajireen. I mean, who are the Shia attacking? Right? Abu Bakr and Umar and Aisha. They're Muhajireen. But this ayah is for all the Sahaba. Allah describes them as Sadiqun. This infers the obligation of accepting their testimony. If Allah tells you they are truthful, they don't lie, are you going to now say we can't accept their testimony? And this is not even touching that He called them believers twice. He called them believers twice in this ayah. And he praised them with many other praises. But what concerns us here is the description of them as sadiqun. For this reason, anyone who has shown a sahabi, sahabi and tells us that their testimony is not valid for any reason, you've contradicted directly the Qur'an. Because they know the Prophet is an impenetrable wall. No one can attack the Prophet. So what do you do? You attack the doorway to the Prophet, which is the Sahaba. And the, the, the two groups that do this, uh, the Shia, and the, uh, that's known, but also the modernists. Okay, The modernists are really uh, after this too. Evidences of their sound understanding of the deen. Who's going to understand the deen better than the Sahaba? Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas ta'muruna bil ma'ruf wa tanhawna al munkari wa tu'minuna billah. If they're the best, what are they the best at? The practice of Islam. Therefore, they must. Are they? The, does Allah say they're the best in technology? Does, are they the best in medicine? Are they the best in politics? What are they the best at? When the Prophet ﷺ says the best of generations is mine, then yours, or then the next one, then the next one, okay? And each one gets worse. Is he talking about tib, medicine? No. Is he talking about locomotion? No. The Prophet's not talking about cars. He's not talking about communication. He's not talking about technology. He's talking about the one thing that matters for your eternal life, deen. Therefore, the best in deen is a sahaba. And therefore, if they're the best in deen, then they're the best in the understanding of the deen. Okay? Believers, you are the best community singled out for people. You order what is right, forbid what is wrong, and believe in God. Their commanding and forbidding requires and implies sound understanding and clear elocution. Okay? If you say someone's the best at something, and he's commanding and forbidding, that means he's telling other people, do this, don't do this, then not only they must understand the best, but they express themselves clearly as well. Okay? You can't be the best person to give advice, but you're not clear in what you're saying. All right? This is Surah Ali Imran. Next ayah, also from Ali Imran. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَلَامُ وَلَوْ كُنْتَ فَضَّنْ غَلِيظَ الْقَلْبِ لَنْ فَضُّ مِنْ حَوْلِكْ فَاعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ فَإِذَا عَزَّمْتَ فَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهِ يُحِبُّ الْمُتَوَكِّلِينَ By an act of mercy from God, you, the Prophet, were gentle in your dealings with them. Had you been harsh and hard-hearted, they would have dispersed and left you. So part of them, and ask forgiveness for them, consult with them about matters. شَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Then, when you have decided on a course of action, put your trust in God. Consulting with them implies sincerity, uprightness, and sound understanding as Allah would not command His Messenger to take counsel from anyone with other than these traits. Will Allah ask, take counsel from someone astray? No. Take counsel with someone who's insincere? No. Take counsel with a fool? No. So the fact that Allah says, take their counsel. Take counsel in what? In administering the deen. Okay? In, in, in practicing this deen. Like, should we... Uh, all their military affairs... How they should interact with the tribes. On every matter in actual implementing the deen, take their counsel. The deen itself has kind of come from Allah and His Messenger. But on the implementation of it, take their counsel. So if you're going to take counsel on implementation, therefore they must have understood it. Okay? Evidence of their general righteousness in the sight of Allah. لَقَدْ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ وَالْمُهَاجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ الَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ فِي سَاعَةِ الْعُسْرَةِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا كَادَ يَزِيغُ قُلُوبُ فِرِيقٍ مِّنْهُمْ ثُمَّ تَابَ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّهُ بِهِمْ رَؤُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ
Okay. He says, in his mercy, God has turned to the prophet and the emigrants and helpers who followed him in the hour of adversary, uh, adversity when some hearts almost wavered. He has turned to them. He is most kind and merciful to them. Allah's turning towards them with forgiveness is a pre-eternal attribute, which includes that what they will do in the future as well. Okay, The action of Allah is a pre-eternal attribute. So his forgiving of them, okay, is already his pre-eternal attribute. And his forgiving of them does not imply that they will make major mistakes. It does not imply kaba'ir. Why? Because he says, he also made tawbah on the Prophet. Does the Prophet make sins? No. Masum. So tawbah does not, just because Allah says he forgives someone, does not imply that they made sins. It implies that maybe they had a shortcoming in doing the good. They did some good. They could have done more. Okay? That Allah overlooked that. لقد رضي الله عن المؤمنين إذ يبايعونك تحت الشجرة فعلم ما في قلوبهم فأنزل السكينة عليهم وثابهم فتح قريبا. God was pleased with the believers when they swore allegiance to you, the Prophet under the tree. He knew what was in their hearts, and so he sent tranquility down to them and rewarded them with a speedy triumph. Again, his rida is his pre-eternal attributes that includes what the commands will do in the future. It includes a tazkiyah or commendation regarding their sincerity and purity of heart. So if anyone then brings you a hadith, okay, well, the Sahaba did this or that. That was, well, yes, we don't say the Sahaba can make a small mistake. The major Sahaba, senior Sahaba, can make a small mistake. Okay, unintentional mistake, because Allah has already shown us, عَلِمَ مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ He knows what's in their hearts, and that is nothing but the good. The Prophet ﷺ said to Sayyidina Uthman, nothing you do after today will harm you. It doesn't necessarily mean, according to the fuqaha, that every single decision that he made would have been the best decision. It could have been, there could have been a better decision. But he did it out of pure intention, right? With a basis, okay? And this is one of the ayahs that shows that he would be without blame. And then lastly, this is a long ayah, which many of you know. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Those who follow him are harsh towards the disbelievers, compassionate towards each other. You see them kneeling and prostrating, seeking God's bounty. On their faces they bear the marks of prostration. This is how they're pictured in the Torah and the Gospels. Like a seed that puts forth its shoot, becomes strong, grows thick, and rises on its stem to the delight of its sowers. So God infuriates the disbelievers through them. God promises forgiveness and a great reward to those who believe and do righteous deeds. According to Madik, this verse means that feelings of agitation towards the companions is an indicator of kufr. Because Allah said, لِيَغِيلَ بِيَمَ الْكُفَّارِ and that such people should be treated as kafirs. Qad Iyad says in his Madarik, Harun al-Rashid entered the masjid and prayed two rakahs, then approached the grave of the Prophet, peace be upon him, then sat in Malik's gathering and said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Malik replied fully and Harun continued, Do those who curse the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, have any right in receiving fate? He replied, No, and they should not be honored. La wa la karama. From where did you get this? He said. Malik answered, Allah says, to annoy the kuffar by them. الكفار, Thus, whoever criticizes them is a kafir and the kuffar have no right in the faith. Okay? Because Allah described the kafir as someone agitated by the companions of a prophet. Imam Malik later explained to this. If you're annoyed by the friend of a man, in fact, then you're annoyed by that man himself. If you have a bad opinion of the product of a prophet, what is the product of a prophet? His sahaba. That's who he produced. If you don't like that, in reality, you don't like the prophets of Allah. It is all a hidden, what you do to the sahaba is a reflection of your opinion of the prophet, peace be upon him. Okay, and there's the Arabic for you. وَمَا لَكُمْ أَلَّا تُنْفِقُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَلِلَّهِ مِرَاثُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لا يستوي منكم من أنفق من قبل الفتح وقاتل أولئك أعظم درجة من الذين أنفقوا من بعد وقاتلوا كل وعد الله الحسنى والله بما تعملون خبير. The point of istidlal here is this part right here. وكل وعد الله الحسنى. What is do you note here? وكل all of them. Okay. All of them من قبل الفتح and after the fatih. Okay, so Allah describes, just divides the Sahaba here in two categories. Why should you not give God's, for God's cause when God alone will inherit what is in the heavens and the earth? 
those who gave and fought before the triumph are not like others. So Allah divided the companions in those who became Muslim before the conquest of Mecca and those who became Muslim after the conquest of Mecca. And then he says, but God has promised a good reward to all of them. All of them. So that no one says, yes, Sahaba in general, but there's some exceptions. No, all of them. Okay. So here's your ayah in the Quran. Kullan, all of them. All of the companions are promised to what? Al-Husna. What is Al-Husna? A general term that refers to the good of this life and the next. What is the greatest of this good of this life? Istiqama, in fulfilling obligations. Teaching and dawah is a collective obligation, right? This verse therefore foretells their sound fulfillment of this duty. That they will collectively fulfill the duty of dawah and tabligh properly. Or else how would they be deserving of the reward of al-husna? And that's it. So these are, how many did we count here? One. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Eight. Nine. Okay. Nine. Ayahs that indicate number one sound testimony number one their completeness that all of them not some of them all of them their sincerity that Allah has accepted them that Allah has already forgiven them any mistakes that they may make and that to accept them as witnesses and testimony is obligatory does that mean every jurist and every scholar will apply every ijtihad of a sahabi no not necessarily you can have a sahabi like Ibn Mas'ud is famous for having many conclusions that the scholars don't practice. I'll give you another example that all four madhabs don't apply. The fatwa of Ibn Umar, Ibn, Sayyidina Ibn Umar, he gave a fatwa. And it was also Ibn Abbas. Two huge, big sahaba. They gave a fatwa that the woman who is nursing and pregnant and doesn't fast because of nursing and pregnancy, that she doesn't have to make up those days. There are too many days. So she just feed people instead. Fidya. Now, why is it that they don't accept it? Because they didn't accept it because Allah specified who is it that has an excuse to break their fast, number one. And number two, they may not accept it. They accept, in theory, Ibn Umar, his testimony, and Ibn Abbas's testimony. But this narration has only come down from a few sources. So it's not strong enough to override a Qur'anic teaching or to qualify a Qur'anic teaching. So yes, does this mean that every single Sahabi statement is going to be part of our fiqh? Not necessarily, but not because of any attack upon them. Maybe simply the narration has been thin. Maybe it's already it's contradicting something in the Qur'an. Not contradicting, but we already have a statement from the Qur'an, so it won't qualify it. And this is fiqh. This is fiqh. What I'm talking about is this, what we're just discussed, and these ayahs, this is usul. And it's aqidah as well. So don't confuse the two. Fiqh is, okay, well this narration is stronger than this one. Right? That's fiqh. But the usul of the matter, the roots of the matter, is that we accept the testimony of all the sahaba. Okay. And what Sheikh Mecha'il is going to do now for you is show you now uh, the dangers and harms of what they're trying to do. But this is the textual evidence that really, without doubt, and, and maybe the Dar Salaam folks can email you uh, everything, inshallah. They can email you this document. You, have, you want, you need this? While we wait for them in the uh, office to uh, upload uh, the document that I want everyone to look at as we go through um, my section of it. Um, before we go into that, 
Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Allahumma inna nasaluka al-huda wa tuqa wa al-afa'afa wa al-ghina ya rabbil alameen Bismillah So um, we have to understand as from the perspective of epistemology and um, where we gain our sources of understanding and our world view um, we all understand as Muslims that it comes from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and it's, it's impossible for those who wish to deconstruct the deen to attack uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so the, the first way is to the point by which we know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which is to attack the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in um, so the importance of this credo position of our understanding and belief of the role and position and status of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in is of the utmost importance and the reason is this um, when we had the panel discussion yesterday Daniel talked about some of the natural consequences of um, you know, feminism, for example. Um, if you read through some of the academic works that are deconstructing or wishing to reconstruct Sharia, what you'll find is that um, the Sahaba have to end up being attacked um, because certain Sahaba are narrating certain narrations uh, regarding the role of women. Uh, and what they do is they normally will uh, speak negatively about these various Sahaba. Um, so what has to be understood is that the maqam of the Sahaba, as we saw in light of the ahadith, in light of the Qur'an, the role and respect that we have to have um, for the Sahaba is, is of the utmost importance. Um, but that is where the, um, the objections come in. That is where the objections come in. That is where the, 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 um, uh, they, they try to attack uh, the deen and deconstruct the deen is going at the Sahaba. That's Abu Huraira specifically and other Sahaba that narrated different things. They'll cast doubt into them and who they are. Um, the problem with that obviously is um, we have no access to the Prophet except through the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in. Okay, so it's extremely important for our students of knowledge and uh, for our, our, our leaders to teach and understand and know the role of the Sahaba. Um, and so what I wanted to go through here is um, a colleague of mine is uh, writing a paper or writing a book on this topic um, uh, regarding hadith. And I wanted to go through with you guys after we've gone through the Quranic references and we've gone through the hadith references for the role of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala an, anhum ajma'in and the primacy of the Sahaba. We've got that. Dr. Shadi, alhamdulillah, knocked that out of the park. You can't deny that the Quran is, uh, is, 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 is saying that these are special individuals and the Prophet sallam, is saying that these people are off limits. Uh, and and we, we understand that. Now I actually want to look more deeply into some of the criticisms that can arise or have been brought up about the uh, adala of the Sahaba or the bapt of the Sahaba. Now the bapt means um, their memory, their ability to retain. And adala by now means what? Well, that was the whole first 30 minutes. We understand what adala is. So I want to look through a few things here, um, inshallah ta'ala. I'm not able to give you this PDF um, because the author has not published the book yet. So he asked me very politely that go to Dar Salaam, share this information, but don't print the book, the, the paper up for them because then they won't buy my book. <laughs> so inshallah, please take notes um, because there are a lot of gems that we're going to discuss in this next 30 to 45 minutes inshallah ta'ala. Or I think I only have about 30 minutes. Um, First thing we need to understand that the, the Sahaba, they lived with him, they studied with the Prophet Sallallahu and they had the responsibility of فَلْيُبَلِّغُ shahid al ghaib فَلْيُبَلِّغُ shahid al ghaib um, We need to speak about the, the hadith that says, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Allah chose me 
and Allah chose my companions, right? We need to understand that the people selected to be in the company and share time and space with the Prophet Sallallahu are a special group of people that are chosen for that specific responsibility. So casting doubt, right? Casting doubt on the integrity of the Sahaba is, is, is it destroys all of our, episte our epistemology. It destroys everything we have. You don't have the Quran, you don't have hadith, you don't have anything because they're the gateway, they're the bab, they're the way to the Prophet ﷺ. So protecting that is of the utmost importance. Now, so it comes down to Islamic epistemology. So there, is a, there are a few different uh, works that I've read by recent, re recent academia that are trying to reconstruct the, the, the femi Islam in a feminist light. And the only way they can do that is go straight to the Sahaba who are narrating a hadith about women. That's the only way they can do that. And then to say that they had misogynistic ten 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 uh, tendencies, that, that they didn't like women, which, which would almost be after listening to what Dr. Shadi said, tantamount to kufr, because you're making an ilzam about the integrity of who they are. But you'll see this now, after having gone through this and you read the different works, it should stick out right away when you see someone even speaking about the Sahaba in a slightly, in a way where it just slightly makes it, well, maybe he thought this. La hawla wa la quota illa billah. No, please, off limits. Protect yourself from the Sahaba. We don't speak on them, right? But so the point is, I, I don't mean to reiterate myself here. For the Shabab, you have to understand the reason why it's a creedal position is because first and foremost, the way Allah chose the Prophet, the way that Allah is going to choose the preservation of the message and the people that are there taking the message. That's creedal to us. So the only way that they now start to deconstruct it is hit the Sahaba. So let's go forward. Uh, the next thing, the word um, Sahabi, as we went through, is not restricted to, to uh, companionship of any specific duration. Um, but when we use it, uh, obviously we're speaking about those who... I'm sorry, one second. I'm not used, all right, there we go. Alhamdulillah. Um, every Muslim who accompanied the Prophet Sallallahu and saw him, and you explained how not just seeing with physical eyes, being in the presence, some have also said and died upon and die upon Islam, exactly. So there's a few different de definitions of who a Sahabi is. We don't have to go into that right now. I want to talk more about the adala of them. Now, now some scholars now, just because we say they are all uh, rudul or they all have the quality of adala, that does not mean that they are all at the same level. Um, some scholars have classified them into uh, uh, al-hakam, for example. He put them into categories of 12 categories of Sahaba. 12 different categories, levels of Sahaba. So just the fact that they all have adala does not mean <clears throat> that they all have the same rank necessarily. All right, so we don't have to come to that, that, that conclusion. Um, now, what do we mean by adala? You went into some of this. Um, the main thing we need to understand is this, right here. That adal or adala means that the testimony it, it, it is, is legal proof of that person. The words that they say are legal proof. That's what that means. That their words, لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاء عَلَى النَّاسِ لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاء عَلَى النَّاسِ Now, that word in, uh, is also the uh, pro, uh, probity of the companions. The adala refers that we, we take their narrations without question. Now, Sheikh, uh, Dr. Shadi, uh, he explained that does not mean that we'll take each um, narration and use that as a proof. We went through that. Everyone understand that point? Just because we accept it doesn't mean it necessarily has to conclusively be an evidence for something because there may be other circumstances that will lower the authority of that and uh, that does not mean we don't take it. We understand it to be from the Sahaba. See what the, what the Orientalists are doing and what the Reconstructionists are doing, they're questioning the, the, the information that's coming in the first place. We don't even want to take this anymore from them. We'll take it, but we may put it to the side and say, well, based on these circumstances, which is fiqh that Dr. Shadi explained, that is the whole yufaqihu fiddin, is you're able to look at all of these statements of the Sahaba and place them in, 
you know, in uh, conversation with one another and pull out the ahkam uh, from that. So now, to be clear, so let's look at this now. The next thing is that when we say adala, one of the things that we're saying is that does that mean that they never committed sins? And does that mean that they never lied? Does it mean that they never committed sins? And does it mean that they never lied? And do these things disqualify uh, the Sahaba? We're going to go into that more detail. Let's look at a few more verses on this. These are verses that Dr. Shadi uh, spoke about on already. Muhammad Rasulullah wa ladina ma'ahu wa shidda. We went through that already. All of these are verses which clearly speak about the uprightness and the importance of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Let's look at a few hadith before we go forward. La tasubu ashabi, ashabi kan nujum, ittaqillah fi ashabi. Narration after narration where the Prophet ﷺ is explaining that your way to understanding my deen is that you keep the Sahaba up and you protect your tongue from disparaging them and putting them down. Uh, we won't go through these hadith because uh, Dr. Shadi uh, went through those already. So these verses and hadith, they become what establishes the virtue, the virtue, the virtue of the Sahaba. But do these necessarily prove the adala, the uprightness of the Sahaba? Well, let's look at that in more detail. Um, the adala of the ordinary narrator is established via the approval of one or more scholars. So let's look at this. If you have a hadith and there's many narrators, we're talking about chains of transmission. If you have a narration and it has multiple narrators, how do we find out that those that hadith is a sound, good narration. It's based on the adala and the, uh, the, the, the uprightness of each individual. So here's the question that's asked. Do the same standards of adala for everyone after the sahaba, are those standards applied to the, to the sahabi as well? Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Meaning this, let me give an example. You have a hadith in Sahih Bukhari. Narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an And there's three people after Abu Huraira Okay Now in order to say that that hadith is sound We look at each person in that narration And we apply a, 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 a system That sifts through this person To see if he has the quality of adala and bapt Adala means uprightness again And bapt means his ability to hold on to the message is, Are those standards also applied to the sahabi as well? That's the question that we're asking here. So we have a few, uh, Ibn Najjar and Mukhtar, Mukhtar al-Tahrir, and uh, Fadail al-Saniya, different things, different places. What are they saying? Since the probity of an ordinary narrator is established via the approval of one or more scholars, the aforementioned praises form none other than Allah and His messengers, a fortiori, a, a fortiori suffice as testimony to the uprightness of the companions. What tells us about the uprightness of a narrator in the chain? The testimony of those who were muta'asir and in, in, in the same time of that narrator. So what we have here is testimony from the Prophet Sallallahu regarding his ashab. Similar testimony is what we use to hold up the adala of people in this chain of narrator. So uh, people like Ibn Najjar, uh, rahimahullah, and Mukhtar al-Tahrir are establishing that the same way we have testimony for uh, the other narrators, which is based on people around that narrator. I'll give an example. Imam, Abu uh, Imam, uh, Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, is going to take a narration from someone. He's going to, he heard this person has a narration. And it's a well-known story. He goes and he sees the person holding up his, 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 uh, the front of his kamis like this, in front of his horse. Right? He's calling his horse to him, holding up the front of his clothes, as if he has food there. And as the horse comes thinking there's food, he lets it down, there's no food, and he grabs the, the reins of the horse. He was just using that. Imam Bukhari was walking towards him to ask him about a narration. When he saw that, he turned around. He turned around. He said, nope, I can't take a narration from this man. 
the adala of this man is being uh, understood by Imam Bukhari. So we don't have any revelation giving us the, the, uh, the standards for uh, uprightness of narrators. This is something that is very misunderstood in our communities. That our, uh, authentic, our strengthening and weakening of narrators is something that's understood by the people who are around that person. So this adala and this dhaqt that we have established for the Sahaba, Ibn Najjar rahimahullah in Mukhtar al-Tahrir is explaining that, that we're getting a testimony from Allah and from the Prophet sallallahu regarding these people and regarding the uprightness that they have. Now, what are, the, what are the four criticisms? Let's talk about four specific criticisms that have been uh, leveled against the uh, adala, collective adala. Because what is our usul? Did you say the, uh, the, the maxim? as sahaba kulluhum? Yes. So this is, a, in, uh, you know, you read any book of aqidah, we'll study that as sahaba kulluhum udul. That all of the sah sahaba, we hold that they have this level of adala. But here are four criticisms. Let's look at them, each one. Four criticisms that try to deconstruct or take away the fact that all the sahaba have the quality of adala. Number one. The presence of munafiqeen. Number one, the presence of munafiqeen. Some would try to use this as an excuse to, as a way to take down the collective adala of sahaba. Number two, the companions would criticize one another. So if the companions could criticize one another, then it wasn't a credo point for them. Does everyone understand the objection? Number three, this maxim defies human nature. How so? How so? How does it defy human nature? The maxim of as sahaba kulluhum udul. Daniel. Defies human nature. Someone may lay this claim. Yeah, yeah, exactly. How can a whole category of people, just because they're a category of people, that defies human nature. There's going to be some of them that aren't, don't have adala. Understood the objection? Is everyone with me? <laughs> Number four. Some companions com reportedly committed major offenses. So how do we have collective adala when some of the Sahaba committed major offenses? These are four objections that are brought up to break down the, the maxim that what? a sahaba kulluhum udul that sahaba, all of them uh, have the collective uh, uprightness let's look at the first one forgive me for I'm, I'm not used to uh, whatever computer this is okay the first objection is the known presence of munafiqeen among the companions so before you read forward look at me for a moment um what we're saying here is, wait, you're saying all the Sahaba are udul. But then you're saying, all right, everyone's reading, so I'm just going to like slide up. There we go. Let's do reading. Okay. We're saying the Sahaba kullum udul. But were there munafiqeen? Taba'an. Taba'an, for sure. There were munafiqeen. So you've just contradicted yourself. What is the answer? Someone who hasn't read forward. Yes. Did you, did you? Okay, good. Alhamdulillah. Excellent. So, Jamal al Din al Mizzi in the 8th century Hijri aptly observed there is no narration from anyone among the companions accused of hypocrisy. Could they? So, the first thing is first thing first, that what the brother just said is categorically speaking, we don't consider the Munafiqeen Sahaba. That's the very first thing. So, the maxim automatically excludes the munafiqeen. First thing first. Got that one? This is, yeah, this is like, this will help you brothers, inshallah. Okay? First thing. Second thing. Second thing. The munafiqeen were ma'roof. The munafiqeen were ma'roof. So, so here, Jamal al-Din Mizzi, he says, 
There exists no narration from among any of the commands of, of, uh, accused of hypocrisy. Could they have camouflaged in the midst of the Sahaba? Here's the question. How do we know none of the Ruat were of the Munafiqeen? Very simple. Who remembers the story of Ka'b bin Malik? Remember Ka'b bin Malik didn't go for Tubuk? What did he say when he, when he realized he was, left, he was behind? When he was walking around Medina, what did he say? He said, like, I noticed I was there and I only saw who? The handicap and the munafiqeen. Well, hold on, hold on. You know how we have handicap parking? There would have been like munafiqeen parking. That's how ma'ruf, yani they were ma'ruf. He's saying, I'm walking around and I only see the handicap and the people ma'ruf bil munafiq. Bil munafiq. Do you see how this understanding can uh, um, show us how they could not have just filtered in or camouflaged into the Sahaba because they were understood, everyone knew. And now this is just one example. Another thing, there's a few examples of this where the term, uh, those who we know, but the other is that, what about this? Hudayfa bin Yaman, what knowledge did he have? Do you guys remember the knowledge he was given? A secret knowledge. He knew who the munafiq, munafiqeen were. So there seems to be a contradiction in my statement. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You just said it was open public knowledge and now you're saying Abu, Abu, Abu Dhaifa bin Yaman had secret knowledge. So how do we solve this? The, uh, the way they resolve this is that some of the, the, the munafiqeen there was knowledge that was given to Hudayfa bin Yaman. But besides the Sahaba knowing like Ma'ruf bin Munafiq, the other thing that they were taught in the Quran speaks about are the signs of munaf uh, Munafiqa. Right? So, so Hudayfa bin Yaman has knowledge. But look at this. Abu Zur al-Razi in the 3rd century Hijri, he says that they exceed, the Sahaba exceed 100,000. However, barely 2% of them actually transmitted hadith. Although Al-Hakam mentions that 4,000 companions narrated uh, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Dhahabi clarifies rather that it's roughly only 1,500 individuals and it definitely does not reach 2,000. So what we're saying here is that the ratio of munafiqeen amongst the Sahaba was, was, was extremely small and smaller than that is the ratio of people that we have narrating hadith from the hundred and one hundred thousand sahaba narrating hadith. One hundred thousand. And what is he saying? Imam Dhahabi is clarifying, uh, telling us that what? Fifteen hundred of the sahaba are narrating hadith. Two percent, um, less than two percent. That small number is the number of people that we have narrating a hadith. And what they're establishing here is basically the fact that we knew the Sahaba, certain Sahaba were given private knowledge of other uh, munafiqeen, and not only that, the number of narrators was so low, so low, that it was easy for them to sift through this small number of Sahaba when it comes to all of the collection of uh, collective, the, the whole age, uh, gathering of uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of Sahaba, the number of narr narr narrators is so low that it was easy for them to highlight and see if there was any one from amongst those, that list, whether it be Hudayfa bin Yaman, who knows who they are, or whether it be the collective public parking in the uh, Munafiqeen spot um, that everyone knew about. So, let's go through the first objection. The first objection is there were Munafiqeens. So if there were Munafiqeen, how can all the Sahaba be Udul? The answer to that is, first and foremost, Sahaba are not considered, Munafiqeen are not considered Sahaba, number one. Number two, the Sahaba collectively knew who the Munafiqeen were, whether it was by name or by sign, and other Sahaba were giving private information. Let's look at the second objection. Any questions on this one? Okay, second one. Nam. So the, 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 the way we, we handle that contradiction is that uh, both are possible. That Sahaba knew the majority of the, the well-known munafiqeens, 
uh, but Hudayfa bin Yaman was given a special knowledge of a, a smaller collection of a few munafiqeen. Wallahu anu. But that doesn't negate. The, the point is, it's not mutually exclusive. The, the point is that the way that we handle this is not, they're not mutually exclusive. The fact that Hudayfa bin Yaman knows some Sahaba does not mean the secret list of, of, of munafiqeen, sorry, does not, does not means that there's no collective knowledge of the, all of the Sahaba. They're not mutually exclusive. Wallahu a'ala. Second. Second objection. Sahaba kulluhum udul. Since the companions criticize one another, one may argue why is it not allowed for other people to criticize them? First thing first. There is no sound evidence that the companions criticized one another. You'll be hard pressed to found a sound narration where they criticize the integrity of one another. So the, the, the premise is wrong in the first place. However, now let's look at this though. This is a, a bit nuanced. However, in rare cases, some of them labeled others as munafiqeen. But this was expressed in a fit of religiously motivated anger without the literal meaning being intended. Or it was based on what was apparent only be to corrected by the Prophet. Let me give an example. Let me give an example. Ka'b bin Malik. Ka'b bin Malik. Same exact thing. When, he was, when they reached Tabuk, what did some people say about him? Ah, munafiq, this and that. And what did the Prophet Sallallahu do? He corrected it. He corrected it. So in the few cases where a Sahabi called another, the way our scholars have explained that is that the literal meaning of nifaq was not mean, meant, number one, or number two, that the Prophet ﷺ always corrected that later and clarified who the munafiqeen were and who they weren't. After hearing a hadith, oh, this is important. Um, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala an, she heard a hadith she believed was misunderstood. So she narrated, this happens a lot with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, that someone narrates a hadith like Abu Huraira, and she narrates contradiction. But look at the wording she, would, she used many times. She said, indeed, you narrate to me from those who neither lie nor have been lied to. Interesting. She's saying, he's saying contradiction to me, but he's not lying. Meaning, that she's establishing the epistemological status of another Sahabi. Even though the, the evidence coming is contradicting her own position. I'm going to say that one more time. She's establishing the epistemological authority of other Sahaba, even though it's contradicting what she's saying. You are narrating to me from people who never have neither lied nor been lied to. Let's go to the next one. Third, this maxim divides human nature. The companions were, like other humans, prone to weakness, error, forgetfulness, and desires. So how could they be collectively up upright? When we say the Sahaba kulluhum udul, we are not referring to uh, all areas of human weakness. We're not saying that they never forget. We're not saying that they don't get tired. We're not saying that they... No, we're saying that um, the influence of the Prophet wasallam's companionship with them and Allah choosing them to be the uh, custodians of the, of the message after the Prophet wasallam necessitates that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the integrity, the uprightness, and the dhabt of the Sahaba. So look at these few examples. Umar bin Khattab says, we were a low people, Allah brought us up through Islam. Allah raised us through Islam. Meaning, the companionship with the Prophet wasallam is what put us on this level. Not that we're special people, but the fact that we were in this position with the Prophet wasallam is what put us on this level. Every non-Muslim acknowledged the Prophet wasallam's ability to influence society. This is something well known, uh, historically undebated, uh, his power of influence. And the Prophet wasallam's statement, the best people are those of the generation I was sent. So we see factors that have led to them being collectively uh, raised up and given this position. And we see hadith that tell that Allah chose these people to be around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when we say Udul, 
kulluhum udul, it doesn't mean that they are, uh, they, they don't have any fallacy, they don't have any of the regular human errors that, uh, that accompany human beings. They can forget, they can make mistakes, all of these things, but the piety, the adala, adala, was something that was inspired in their hearts by the Prophet ﷺ. There was no treacherousness in them. Now, the adala is directly connected. The uprightness is directly connected to dhabt. And we'll see that in a, in, in a minute, inshaAllah ta'ala. Um, how about this? Uh, the, the fourth one is how their collective pro, uh, probity uh, is reconcilable with the, uh, the, the sins that they did, the major offenses uh, that they did. Um, this doesn't uh, uh, destroy their integrity. Um, we all know the, the power of Toba. Uh, there are so many ahadith where, uh, the, first of all, the power of Toba is spoken about. Uh, so many sahaba who were from Ahlul Badr and the Prophet Sallallahu said, the Ahlul Badr have done such actions that uh, their adala cannot be dropped after. Um, because of the sacrifices that they made. So the overall righteousness overshadows or uh, uh, makes that those small actions as if they were nothing compared to the overall righteousness and uprightness uh, and, the, and the good works that they did, especially Al-Muhajirin and Awalin, uh, the first group. Now, I know I have a very little, uh, little time, but I really want to go to the retention. The retention means, okay, okay, we agree. Sahaba were all upright. They were adal, adal, they were with the Prophet Sallallahu the presence made them upright and pious people. What about their memories though? What about their memories, the bakt? What about their bakt, their memories? We have to understand that when hadith scholars evaluate the reliability of a narrator, both adala and retention are deeply connected with, with one another. And the reason is this. If a person has forgotten, the adala is what will allow the person to say what? Nasit. I forgot. Or say, aw kama so, so, so the adala is deeply connected with the quality of but. Does everyone understand that point? So let's, let's look at a few things. If the person has adala, an upright transmitter would only transmit material which they have certainty about. That's the quality of Adala. Towards the end of his life, look at Anas bin Malik. Anas bin Malik, he was asked a question and he would go, go to Hassan al-Basri. Go and ask Hassan al-Basri. Indeed, we heard and he heard. But he remembers we forgot. What is this showing? It's showing that when we say they have dhabt, kamil dhabt, it doesn't mean sahaba would never forget. It just means when you accompany dhabt with adala, that Anas bin Malik is being asked the question, and he's saying, go to Hassan al-Basri, because we heard and we have forgotten. He's heard and he still remembers, so go to him. Campaigners like Abdullah bin Mas'ud and Abu Darda, what did they start to, uh, uh, start to say? Oh, come on, call or something like this, or something like this. Why? Because as the dhabt was diminishing, the adala still kept the standard there, right? The adala still kept them to saying, wait, no, 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 we cannot transmit wrong from the Prophet So we find people like uh, Abdullah bin Mas'ud and Abu Darda starting to say, O kamaqal, O kamaqal. Oh, come on, call. No, it was, it was something like this. And if you read Sahih Muslim, subhanAllah, you know, some, some tabi'een, they were like, we accompany a sahabi for a month and he would never say, Qala Rasulullah. And one time he said it and his face turned red. There's a narration in Sahih Muslim. And, and he realized that he just said, it was the kal jiba. It was like a huge thing for them. It was a huge thing for them to transmit from the Prophet Sallallahu so, so we have to look at it all collectively and holistically and understand how the adala was directly connected uh, to the... I know I only have a minute or so left, but let's just read a few, a, a few more things. Companionship with the Prophet ﷺ does not increase one's memory. Companionship with the Prophet ﷺ doesn't give someone a, a better memory. Some of the Sahaba did not have 
uh, good memories. So even if we accept that the commands were upright, how are we sure that they're transmitting them correctly? Um, so it's important to understand, as we said, that from the Islamic perspective, when Imam Shafi shakotu ila waki asu'a hivdi, what did he say to him? Come on, tu labul ilm, fa'arshadni ila tarkil maasi. From the Islamic perspective, how, what is memory directly connected to? Sin. Ah, this is very important. We understand that hif and memory has a connection. And in Imam Shafi, so I can narrate the poem, many of us may not know the poem. Imam Shafi, he went to his teacher, Waqiyah, and he complained about his memory being weak. فَأَرْشَدْنِي إِلَىٰ تَرْكِ الْمَعَاسِ he said, ah, your memory is weak because of some sin. Do toba for the sin, the memory will come back. Because it's a nur from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ibn Masood, look at what Ibn Masood says. I believe a person forgets knowledge on account of some wrong he commits. Imam Malik was asked how to improve one's memory. He replied, if anything would improve it, then avoiding sins improves memory. Very interesting, our perspective on the relationship between memory and, and, uh, and sins. So, not only that, what do we see? The Prophet ﷺ, they listened to the Prophet ﷺ attentively. They consulted him. These are all supported with textual evidence. These statements all are supported with textual evidence from the hadith. They consulted him within doubt about a hadith. Revise whatever they learned from one another. All of these are supported contextually. And some of them even employed memory, uh, memory aids in the form of printed material. They listened closely. They consulted him about what he said. They revised it together. And then some of them even wrote it down. All of these four things, we have sound script, uh, text, textual evidence to support that the Sahaba did this to support the hadith that they were narrating. On top of that, and this is the last thing, we have the teaching methods. The teaching methods employed by the Prophet ﷺ to ensure that the Sahaba retained exactly what he said. Let's look at the first thing. And we'll stop with these four, three things. Number one, everyone's read this hadith before. They say when the Prophet ﷺ would speak, you could count his words. And he would repeat things three times. Like, can you think you could count the words you said today? The Sahaba. <laughs> we talk for a living. We talk for a living, right? So, so, but the Sahaba said we could count. We could count the words that he said. And he would, Anas bin Malik explains that uh, when he would say something, a person would be able to count his words, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then repeating his words three times uh, was something he would do regularly. Repeat his statement. Look in Shema and we'll see that it talks about how he spoke. Number, number, number two. His method of teaching was a gradual method. Uh, which made it easier for them. So or when Mu'adh, when he's teaching Mu'adh about to go to Yemen, look how he teaches him. What will you do first? What will you do second? What will you do third? Then do this. One, two, three. Counting them out gradually before them. And then, subhanAllah, we find that he avoided only one or twice, once or two times did he have very long sessions of learning. Many times the sessions of learning were very short. I think the, 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 the what is now pedagogical, pedagogical thought say 45 minutes is the longest, right? After that is done, right? So Prophet some kept very short majalis where people could keep it all. And then number three, the Prophet Sallallahu used very, various uh, visual aids and rhetorical methods to make sure that that message was, was established, that meaning was kept in the hearts. So let's look at, let's recap. We have two things that the Sahaba have to have in order to narrate to us. Bakt is retention. Retention of the message. And adala, uprightness. They are both intrinsically connected. And the reason they're intrinsically connected is because if the bakt is slipping, then the adala will keep the person upright and say, hey, I can't remember this. They won't narrate what they weren't sure of. They're directly connected to each other. Um, 
Then we have the concept of adala. We went through just four objections that uh, that you know academics and people raise against the Sahaba: the presence of munafiqin, the presence of sins that were committed, um, the the uh, of defying human nature, and the other one that we discussed. These brothers and sisters are discussed. Why Sahaba are our gateway to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Once you read a paper where you see someone beginning to now do tanqeed and, 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 and pick at the Sahaba, understand that the intent there is that we have no way to deconstruct the deen. All we can do is cast doubt on the Sahaba. It's our job to pass on to the next generation the maqam of the Sahaba, the level of the Sahaba, and protect our deen to preserve it as it was Alhamdulillah, Dr. Shadi, Alhamdulillah, went through... Um, what did you say about major offenses? The rebuttal for major offenses? Uh, the rebuttal for major offenses was, I believe, uh, Afwan. Yes. What some scholars have said about the, re the major offenses is that you have to look at that in light of all of the collective good that they were doing as well. Hatim uh, bin Abi Belta. Hatim bin Abi Belta. He does what seems to be a major treachery. Right? Major treachery. Um, the, he, he sent a letter. He was trying to protect his family. It's a, it's a long story. Um, and Sahaba were extremely upset. But then the Prophet Sallallahu overlooks that major sin by saying what? Perhaps Allah looked at Ahlul Badr and said to them, If al, do whatever you want. So the immense good that they did overshadowed and, and just it was like a drop of a, just a drop into the sea of goodness. A drop. And you know, subhanAllah, the, my, our teacher taught us how fit connects to spirituality was, you know, you know, if you have a ma'ul kathir, let's look at fiqh for a minute. If you have Ma'al Kathir, you know, I know you Malik, he's even Malik Qalil, right? If you, uh, if you have Ma'al ma, uh, ma Kathir and you drop Najasa in Ma'al Kathir, does it make the whole thing Najas? No. If you have Ma'al ma Qalil and you put Najasa, not for the Malikis, you guys still drink it? Yes or not? Go ahead. <laughs> okay, we'll do, we'll do. Okay, cool. Does it, for, for, for us, if it's mal qalil, you put a little wrong into it, the whole thing is fasid. For us, if it's mal kathir, you put one drop of najasa, it's still clean. Our teacher said that the actions of the elders of the community, the elders of the community, they're like mal kathir. For him too, us little guys, we're mal qalil. We're mal qalil. You drop a little, it messes us up. But the elders, no oh man, my kathir. They've done so much good for the community. The uncle that has a temper, he's done so much good for the community. Ah, oh, forget it, it's all good, yo. It's all good. My kathir doesn't get messed up from drops of najasa. But for us little guys, it does. So that's one way that some scholars have reconciled that. Um, um, uh, my, my colleague, Muntasar Zaman, Mufti Muntasar Zaman, publishing a book on this right now. Um, it's important, brothers and sisters. Um, our deen has become a plaything to academics. Um, I'm going to just say it very clear. Our deen has become a plaything to academics. Uh, looking at it all around. Hey, look at this thing. Pull this thing out. Pull this thing out. Pull. So it's very important for you to critically look at the knowledge you consume. Because in the ilm deen. Knowledge is deen. For us, it's deen. For them, it's just a, a PhD. I'm getting my thesis on this joint. Like, that's it. There's no real consequence to that. So we have to be careful where we're getting knowledge from. Our point here is for you to recognize the maqam of Sahaba and to expose you to some of the objections made about the Sahaba regarding adala and dabt, inshallah ta'ala. Um, any other questions for either one of us regarding this? I know time is up, but any questions at all?
Yeah. Sheikh Mikael, you can quote the entire verse. <coughs> but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about those people, الَّذِينَ يَخُوضُونَ Right? فِي آيَاتِ اللَّهِ Those who are going into the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and like he said, picking and looking and just with no taqwa and no motive that we have to live by this. Okay? فَلَا تَقْعُدْ مَعَهُمْ Allah says, don't sit with them. And the subject matter of this, and we were actually just asking you about this, is Hujranu Ahlil Bida that Wal Ahwa that people who uh, are people of Ahwa, whims and innovations, that Ibn Sirin, Malik, many other scholars said don't even sit with them. Okay? Why? Because he could say a word, interpret it in a way, and that could enter into your heart. Okay? And they attributed that Abu Talib could not say the Shahada upon his deathbed. Why? Because he used to keep the company of Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl. That keeping the company affected his deathbed status. Even Rasulullah was alone with him in a room. He couldn't say it. He couldn't just speak with the Shahada. So this ayah says, وَلَا تَقْعُدْ مَعَهُمْ إِنَّكُمْ إِذَنْ مِثْلُهُمْ Otherwise, you're just like them. So this idea of a Sunni Muslim sitting with some of these academics and sharing as if we're all the same. A Quran tell them, don't sit with them. Forget, they said he's sitting with them for a chat. Let alone taking knowledge from them. You must be out of your mind. Let me add, let me add to that real quick. Um, I think we also, as I, we said yesterday, عَرَفْتُ الشَّرْ لِلشَّرْ وَلَكِنْ لِتَوَقِّهِ Like we learn about evil and the objections against our deen, not because we like evil, but rather to uh, protect ourselves from it. It's a fardu kifaya though. Uh, we do need pr people of the community to uh, study these objections and uh, uh, handle them for the community. That's a minutia. That's a minutia. But for the general uh, community, just going and taking Islamic studies classes before you've sat with traditional scholars that have grounded you in tradition is absurd. 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 You have to ground yourself first. You have to ground yourself in the tradition first. Get that first. You know your limits. Right? So now after sitting in this just one hour session, you know the limits of, we, we, you know the position of Sahaba. We've gone over the, so the basic text. We've gone over the basic aqidah regarding Sahaba. Now you go in a class and, and you should be able to pick that up right away. Hold on. This is, this is kufr. You should leave the class. Drop it. <laughs> well, even the name shows that they're not imams. Right? <laughs> so look, you have hazardous material. Right? You have hazardous material in this world. If we're people of Iman and we actually practice this and we want to do it, then there is hazardous material for the heart. Okay, there's hazardous material. This idea that people say you should be open-minded and aware, you don't apply that to your body because hazardous material, hazardous waste has to go to a specific spot. You have to have a specific uniform and only a specific trained person can deal with it. There is hazardous material for Iman. And the Salaf used to say, Al bid'atu ahabbu ila iblis min al ma'siyah. A bid'ah is better to iblis than a sin. It's better to sit with someone of a completely different religion than someone who's sitting with you in terms of your Iman and interpreting things and twisting things. So if they say to you, Well, oh, you're not open minded, you're closed minded, you're parochial, right? We say, Well, if that's what you say, Firstly, you're, whatever you say is not accepted in the first place. I'm not listening to what you say in the first place. So you have to know that in your back of your mind, you say, all right, would you consider yourself closed-minded if you refuse to try to taste radon or to refuse to try to touch on your skin something that's known harmful? Well, be open-minded. Why are you limiting yourself? Well, you wouldn't do that with food or chemicals or hazardous material. So this is another trick of shaitan to make you, oh, you're not open-minded, you're closed, you're parochial. Right? This is just indoctrination. These are all little words that shaitan uses to make you feel guilty. But if you look at in the if you put it in the arena of argument, it fails. It's just in the arena of emotions to make you feel down about yourself. 
Yeah. There was another brother here or something. What? Subhanallah. 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 Sub